All right, welcome everyone for this week's Rising Tide Foundation Lecture. We are continuing our symposium into the role of art in shaping the souls and the minds of a citizenry. Um, this has been a fun journey so far. We've looked at different facets of artistic expression from the standpoint of painting, uh, literature, poetry. Today, we're going to get into the audible domain, the sound space of music, and specifically the soul and mind of a, of a great uh, composer, pianist who, I, I've only recently begun to explore, in, in, in all honesty, and it was largely through the provocation by uh, Dr. Valeria Nolan, who uh, really instigated me to really plunge into this, and I, I was happy to discover that Dr. Lo Nolan has finally published a long-awaited um, book called Sergei Rachmaninoff, Cross Rhythms of the Soul. Dr. Nolan, I, I think everyone here has, has seen your bio as the Professor Emerita of uh, Russian Studies at Rhodes College. Um, there's a lot. I mean, your, your experience is incredible. You have done pioneering work on research, not only on Rachmaninoff, but a lot more. You're also a poet and, uh, and somebody with a very strong political insight and consciousness. Uh, we've had the, publish, uh, the pleasure of publishing some of Valeria's works on the Rising Tide Foundation, tapping into ideas of geopolitics, ballet, the arts. It, it's, it's a pleasure. So I've been looking forward to this. I think everyone here has. And so, Dr. Nolan, I will leave the stage for you. And afterwards, when you are finished your presentation for everyone, like usual, put your names in the chat box or use a little digital hand if you'd like to raise a hand. And I will call upon you in queue uh, for the dialogue part of today's show. OK, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Um, do I? Do I uh, click on the share screen to get started or not yet? Yeah, if you'd like to. You're, okay. you're the maestro. Well, all right. <laughs> all right. Well, I want to thank um, Matt, you, and Cynthia Chung for giving me the opportunity to speak in this symposium. I also want to commend both of you for your important work of deconstructing some of the geopolitical challenges facing the rising multipolar world. Uh, the Rising Tide Foundation's interdisciplinary approach to understanding the world, known in the 19th century as philological work. You know, Europe and Russia knew this all along. I gave a lecture at the Russian Academy of Sciences some years ago and was speaking to uh, one of my Russian colleagues there, and she said, we just put everything in, just take everything out, find it, uh, integrate it. And so the interdisciplinary philological approach is so important. And this is something that I really appreciate about Rising Tide Foundation. You incorporate science, philosophy, not only science, philosophy, uh, say political theory, but you go back into history uh, you, you have a broad uh, historical backbone, but also there's, there's an important focus on the arts, uh, on music and music and painting, other forms of culture. And this is so important. I think that, and I, I believe you would agree, that a healthy culture has to have arts in its mainstream. And certainly Russia, many other countries of the world have the arts there. And there is a health that I think comes, you know, comes into play when, when artists of all uh, disciplines are allowed to express themselves freely. And so I really, really appreciate this about the Rising Tide Foundation. Uh, my biography uh, has been called a major event in Rachmaninoff studies. And it's, I think this is because there, there haven't been any uh, biographies recently uh, published that, uh, that present a fullness of Rachmaninoff's identity. And so I, I had um, several different goals when I was um, setting out to write the biography. And I'll, I'll certainly mention, mention them in a minute. But Rachmaninoff had a triple brilliant career as a composer, a virtuoso pianist, and also a conductor. Uh, he is considered one of the great conductors, perhaps one of the greatest conductors of the 20th century. And so if you find collections of great you know, conductors, you know, which 
um, would include such conductors such as Mahler, Rachmaninoff is going to be there. And so this is the part of his um, uh, musical identity that's a little bit less well known. You know, people know him primarily, first of all, as the virtuoso pianist who, uh, who had a, a brilliant performing career and, and as a composer, but he also was a brilliant conductor. I probably should uh, bring up the title of my, let's see. Okay, so, all right. Uh, the title, Cross Rhythms of the Soul. Uh, perhaps all of you are trained in music, but just in case, you know, how, you know, how this came to pass, uh, first of all, was I, I've played Rachmaninoff, I've given recitals uh, of some of his music, and cross rhythms, the idea of uh, rhythm, rhythmic conflict simultaneously, where, for example, one might be playing two eighth notes in one hand, and then triplet eighths in the other hand. And so these, these rhythms that are conflicting but occurring simultaneously. Uh, cross with rhythms, I felt, characterized his life in so many ways, uh, his personal life as well as his performing life, and the, the ways in which he expanded the language of the piano uh, involved these cross rhythms. And so the subtitle, Cross Rhythms of the Soul, uh, has, I think, a number of connotations in the context of the biography. This is a photo of the book and the publisher, uh, Lexington Books of Roman and Littlefield. I, uh, it's available in hardcover and ebook formats and should come out in paperback probably in a couple of years. The, uh, I have the link for you and also it's available on Amazon. And so I thought I would show you a photograph of the cover. And this is a photograph of uh, Rachmaninoff that I had actually never seen before. Uh, when I started working with the publisher on the, uh, during the end stages of production, I was looking everywhere because so many photographs of him are uh, well known, at least you know, to, uh, to people who, uh, you know, who might uh, be interested in seeing these photos. Before, before I go on, I thought that I would let all of you hear a single musical example. And this is from, uh, from start to finish. It runs about three minutes. And uh, the example is, uh, the piece is from the Moment Musico of Rachmaninoff, uh, composed in 1896. Uh, this is number four in E minor, and a number of musicologists have argued that there is no other work like this in the piano repertoire. It's uh, demonic in its beauty. It's, it's very difficult. Uh, I do play it. I don't play it nearly as fast as Lugansky, um, but he is, um, I think many people believe, and I agree that he is the preeminent interpreter of Rachmaninoff's music, that he, uh, he has inherited this long tradition going back to the second half of the 19th century and continuing through the 20th century of the powerful Russian school of piano. And some of that school for, reasons of the Bolshevik Revolution uh, found itself in Europe and in the US, particularly at Juilliard in New York. And so um, by, uh, by that means enriched the uh, piano, piano and classical music circles of the US. But Lugansky is, um, he's very involved in the Rachman world. He performs at uh, Ivanovka, which is the composer's uh, it was the composer's estate, uh, which it's, uh, it's in a very small town, a village 
of about 300. I've been there several times and they have made it into a research center um, and a um, conference center. So Lugansky performs there. Probably he's donated uh, some money to keeping Rachmaninoff activities alive. I did uh, view, uh, I did see him in uh, Florida with the Florida Symphony performing Rachmaninoff's um, Piano Concerto Number no. One. And uh, so, and I, I met him afterwards. My, my husband and son and I flew down for the performance and uh, I you know, was able to make my way backstage and speak with him. And so I've seen him perform, but uh, after you view the performance, uh, I'll bring up a slide with some characteristics of it because Rachmaninoff not only is one of the most misunderstood uh, performers um, and composers of the 20th century, but his music can be played badly and it's played badly if it's sentimentalized uh, and Lugansky does not do this. And so he gives an example of playing Rachmaninoff, I think the way Rachmaninoff himself would like to have his music represented. And Lugansky is uh, now a professor at the uh, um, Moscow Conservatory. And so I'll stop and then continue after, after the performance. Is everybody back? Yep. I am sorry that for some of you, the volume was very low and it was low for me too. Uh, I would, you know, I would encourage you to listen to it again. It's very, it's very dense. It's just a gorgeous piece of music. 
Uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Of... I didn't realize that the we should have done a sound test, but I'm gonna include. I'm gonna make the uh, link available both here in the chat box as well as in the description box for those listening on YouTube. If you want to listen to this in full uh, full effect, click on the link in the description box. Okay. Uh... Well, keep some of this music in mind. Uh, it is, it's just beyond beautiful. This performance uh, was let me, in 2016 in the Mariinsky Theater in St. Petersburg. And uh, what is the Mariinsky? Mariinsky uh, was named for Mary, the mother of God, Theater of St. Mary. And so, uh, Lugansky is very active on the performance circuit. He's also a professor at the Moscow you know, Conservatory. Okay, oh, I thought, I thought, oh my. Okay. Usually the, I, I do up and down on my keyboard and that that's usually works, that works well for me. Okay. But. Well, this, I, I, I couldn't resist. Uh, one of my colleagues sent this to me. And if you listen to the uh, uh, E minor moment, um, music hall, you get a sense of how difficult it is. Um, the, the fingering is extremely important, and it just, if you look at Lugansky's uh, fingers and hands just flying up and down the piano, this may, <laughs> this may come to mind. Let's see. And this slide of uh, this is Rachmaninoff as a young man in concert attire. This is circa 1898. So this would, would be at about the period when the uh, E minor musical moment was composed. And if you look at the slide, you see that he has something around his neck. And this is probably a very light conductor's baton. And so this, this was the period where he started to conduct. He, he was the uh, music director for the Bolshoi Orchestra for one year and uh, gained a great deal of experience. Now the elements, the elements of Lugansky's performance I want to, there we go. First of all, it's very clean. Uh, the elements or the voicings are there. The voicings of the very intricate music can be heard. There is an intense driving forward motion uh, that is almost demonic in its, its beauty. It's devoid of any sentimentality. It displays the sharp rises and falls of dynamics typical of Russian classical music and of Rachmaninoff's sacred choral music. And it allows the melody to speak in the midst of many complex phrases. And so Rachmaninoff was known as a master melodist, similar to Mozart and Tchaikovsky, uh, a composer such as Beethoven, you know, whose melodies we do remember, is not necessarily and not primarily known as a melodist, but we can certainly include Mozart and Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff in that, in that group, in that category. And so Lugansky's performance has all of these uh, important characteristics. And these are characteristics that one would associate with the uh, uh, Russian school of piano as well. My book brings out some of the unexplored aspects of Rachmaninoff's identity as a creative artist and his activities beyond the world of the arts. And this current year of 2023 marks a double jubilee of Rachmaninoff. And this is 150 years since Rachmaninoff's birth in 1873 in Russia and 80 years since his death in 1943 in the US. Uh, the Ministry of Culture of the Russian Federation has officially declared this year the year of Rachmaninoff. And so Rachmaninoff is very important to the Russians. They, they have unmediated access to all genres of his music. One genre that's uh, underrepresented in the West, perhaps because of 
you know, less of an access to the Russian language uh, would be his art songs. And they're just truly gorgeous. And so this, uh, this genre is very popular in, in Russia. Uh, it's translated, I think, inaccurately as romances. They're not really, they're not necessarily romances, they're not necessarily romantic, but they're miniatures of, uh, of life, different intense moments of life. And Rachmaninoff's music is uh, very often uh, spotlighted in uh, recitals of Russian and uh, Western classical art songs or uh, romances. There will be major celebrations and performances of Rachmaninoff's music all over Russia and internationally in countries that are not subject to canceling of Russian culture. Uh, beyond politics and economics, a more sure-footed and just world needs literature especially poetry, but prose as well, uh, and, and it needs music. Art and culture are intended to be higher than politics and at their best become a permanent part of world heritage, of world civilization. Their enrichment of world culture should not be subject to political events. I'll just mention that during the years of World War I, when the uh, Germans were an enemy of Russia, Rachmaninoff refused to vilify Germans and uh, German culture, uh, even though it would have been easy for him to perhaps move to that level of um, interaction with the other culture. He disliked extremes of any kind, whether artistic or political, and he would be appalled at the Russophobia affecting the arts in some parts of the world today. He lived through the turbulent first half of the 20th century. And it's almost amazing that uh, Russia is, has survived all of those events, one after another and some simultaneously. But he made such an important contribution um, in his music uh, to shaping a sovereign citizenry, and here I'm looking at the framework of the sym uh, symposium, in its expression of the sum total of a particular individual's hopes and fears, personal relationships, striving for freedom, and a patriotism understood as love for one's own country and culture, but also appreciating uh, and admiring the uh, country's the cultures of other countries. And so this is not a nationalism understood as elevating one's own above all of the others, but a love for one's own, a patriotism. And so Rachmaninoff you know, could be characterized in that way. And so he was a proponent of art for art's sake, not art as you know, serving some, uh, some other purpose such as political or uh, occasional, let's say, uh, not art constrained and crippled by political directives. Um, my, my presentation is uh, divided into four segments and they should give you a sampling of what is, what is in my book. Uh, if, if your interest is aroused uh, uh, in the course of these remarks that I make, uh, you'll find much more in the book. It's, uh, it's the result of about a quarter of my life and provides many details. I've worked in archives all over the world, and um, it was quite, a, quite an undertaking. The first, sample, the first segment describes some of the backstory of the project, and the remaining three segments engage some of the content of the book. And so it's going to be, I, I suppose, a little bit of a teaser. I can, I can speak for a long time, <laughs> On this, on this subject, but there is, there is much more uh, in the book. I, I was working with a team of uh, specialists in Moscow, uh, also very active in the Rachmaninoff Society, uh, studying, uh, I've studied piano for many years, but studying with my colleague, uh, Kate Stimson, my teacher, and um, 
interacting with Rachmaninoff specialists in the US and Europe and in, in Russia. And so the first segment really um, engages the question of why in the world I would undertake this kind of project because there, there are approximately 40 uh, extant biographies of Rachmaninoff in languages that are accessible to Westerners. I had read many of them, and by the time I finished the biography, had read most of them. And so why, why would I undertake this? The, his, his life involved uh, travels all over Russia, all over Europe, and then after he was forced to leave the leave Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution, he uh, began a schedule of performing in the US and then in Europe. And so he was everywhere and there are archives of him everywhere. Uh, so the, pro the project was really daunting. There is a lot of critical information, there are a lot of uh, musicological uh, studies. And so, you know, I had to consider why in the world am I doing this? Uh, we know the details of his life. We know his uh, performing activities, the political vicissitude that brought about his departure from Russia. Uh, they made they made him they made him what he was. And so, uh, we can listen to his music performed by pianists and uh, orchestras. Musicologists can study his scores and talk about their merits and uh, pro problematic areas. All of these things are known and they can be investigated uh, in Russia and in the West. Uh, by far the two areas that have developed uh, Rachmaninoff research uh, to date. Although uh, in Asia, uh, China, Japan, uh, South America, the Middle East, these areas are, are also discovering Rachmaninoff and uh, are making their own contributions to Rachmaninoff studies. And so he, he was internationally known, but his music is, uh, has survived the test of time. And so why would I attempt this seemingly unendable project of uh, writing about this composer's life? It, it became a personal project, uh, perhaps in more ways than any project is ultimately a personal one. I came to realize that I've been positioned in history in such a way that my cultural background and professional experience had developed in me the arsenal that I needed to tackle such a project. My Russian and Ukrainian roots my musical training and research activities that necessitated traveling to the Soviet Union, to Europe, to Russia, around the US, uh, virtually every year resulted in knowledge that was a part of me and that was authentic. My paternal grandfather, uh, Alexander Pivin, was born in 1872 in Tsarist Russia only one year earlier than Rachmaninoff's birth in 1873. As young boys, both lived through the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881. The young Sergei Rachmaninoff, and I talk about this in the biography, he walked many times past the Church of Christ on the Spilled Blood, or Spasna Kravi, in St. Petersburg, which was built over the spot where the Tsar was killed. And my grandfather grew up in the southern region of Ekaterinodar, which is uh, renamed uh, Krasnodar. He was never in St. Petersburg, but he was devoted to the Tsar, and he was a loyal monarchist. Rachmaninoff eventually moved to a country estate in the south of Russia. This would be south of uh, Tambov, which is a very nice provincial city and a center for Rachmaninoff studies. It's probably southeast, maybe 300 miles southeast of Moscow. And then the estate that he moved to uh, Ivanovka is a couple of hours by car from, from Tambov. And so uh, 
both Rachmaninoff and my grandfather loved to farm and they lived close to the land. And this is perhaps is characteristic so characteristic of Russians in general. There it's a it's um I think one of the values uh, of Russians, this closeness to nature and to the land that goes you know, beyond, you know, beyond a simple connection. My grandfather was a well-known writer and anti-communist activist who in his numerous publications described his life under Tsar Nicholas II. As Rachmaninoff, he fled Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution and he found himself in Europe during the 1920s and 1930s. They moved in similar circles, but to my knowledge, they never met. However, because Russian intellectuals all knew each other in Europe, pretty much, uh, they had friends in common. And one of them was the brilliant choral conductor, Sergei Zharov, known in the West as Serge, looks like Yarov, J-A-R-O-F-F. -F. He was the conductor of the famous Don Cossack Chorus. Zharov fled the Soviet Union from Crimea, in the same group as my grandfather. They were in the same group and in the same places as this, these um, exiles um, made their way to be resettled. Uh, they lived temporarily in Serbia, uh, be, uh, and they both died in Lakewood, New Jersey. And so this was the same city in which my father died. My father knew Serge Yarov. And my father and Yarov to, died only three months apart in 1985. The Russian Orthodox Church was ruthlessly persecuted by the Soviets and forced to organ, reorganize itself abroad in the 1920s in Serbia. And this, of course, later became part of Yugoslavia. My grandfather found himself in Serbia in the 1920s at the end point of the staggeringly well-organized evacuation out of Crimea by Baron Pyotr Nikolaevich Vrangil, commanding general of the anti-Bolshevik White Army, between November 13th and 16th of 1920. Desperate to leave Russia because of the Bolsheviks' widespread acts of violence against the aristocracy, which was Rachmaninoff's social class, <clears throat> Rachmaninoff left the country legally with his family in December of 1917. And I have encountered, I haven't been this, but that the visa issued to him and his family was one of the last visas issued at that time to families uh, or people wanting to, individuals wanting to leave uh, the newly forming Soviet Russia. Uh, at that time. And when, when you think about violence against the aristocracy or violence against intellectuals or um, Russian Orthodox clergy, what does, what does that mean? What is the content of that violence? You know, it's something that can be a word and it, it's simply dismissed, but what was the reality that Rachmaninoff was experiencing? In his estate, uh, in that area, south of Tambov, uh, there would be peasant gangs roaming the countryside and they were manipulated by, by both sides, but they would uh, come onto uh, an estate and Rahmaninoff's estate was medium sized. It was about a about hundred acres and uh, uh, the estate buildings, the manor, and the um, outbuildings were not especially large. Uh, and they had, uh, the family had very good relations with the, uh, with those who worked for them. And so these would be peasants coming from other places. But what they would do was at night, they would come on the estate and they would kill someone and throw that person down one of the wells on the estate. And so if you think about the reality of your own house, wherever you live, and a group, a gang, let's say, comes and they kill someone and just throw them, say, in a trash can somewhere. And this would happen every night. Another example of violence against the clergy, which was very, very common, uh, would be that churches would be raided uh, in uh, 
one uh, church in the south of Russia, uh, not far from where Rachmaninoff's estate was. Uh, the, uh, some of the Soviet committees would, uh, you know, who wanted to eradicate religion um, and particularly Russian Orthodoxy because it was one of the, was and is one of the essential features of Russia. They would come into a church during a service and just uh, either take the priest away or commit some act of violence, torture him, and right in front of the congregation. And so people, these memories, their eyewitness memories are passed down from one person to another. Uh, and Rachmaninoff's uh, older cousin, older, about 10 years older, who was one of uh, Franz Liszt's uh, last students in the 19th century, Alexander Silotti. Silotti was arrested. Uh, he was um, a major figure in the Mariinsky Theater. Uh, he uh, uh, arranged uh, various, the various performance schedules, and he refused to hand over his keys to the Bolsheviks. And so Rachmaninoff's own cousin was arrested, and he was uh, put in prison. And so you can imagine your own reaction if you had a relative, close relative, they were extremely close, who was arrested and put into prison, and you don't know, you don't know when, if and when they're going to come out. And when Salotti did, he was finally released, but he and his family uh, also sought uh, successfully to get a visa and he left uh, Russia and he ended up uh, in New York at um, the Juilliard uh, School. And so these were terrible, terrible things happening. And the writing was on the wall that you know, intellectuals, anyone with um, broader ideas, not wanting to fit narrowly into certain prescribed forms of creative expression, they were not welcome. And more than that, they were threatened with punishment. Rachmaninoff got out of uh, Russia with his immediate family in December of 1917, uh, because uh, serendipitously he received an invitation to uh, make a concert tour of the Scandinavian countries. And of course he jumped on it, it was, it was legitimate. And he took only what was absolutely legal for him to take because he was worried about passing through uh, customs. And so he made, he was able to make his way to Europe and he never saw uh, Russia again in his lifetime. He believed in freedom of expression in the arts, as I've mentioned, and he experienced uh, some of the restrictions on freedom in the, on artistic freedom in the immediate months after the revolution. Both my grandfather and Rachmaninoff were active in the Russian Orthodox Church abroad as it was um, forming, trying to reform itself after the persecution in Russia. My grandfather was a psalomshik, uh, which is a um, highly respected rank in the church, though it's not an ordained one. It's maybe something like a subdeacon, but he knew the services and the music very well. Rachmaninoff was a major financier of the church in Europe and the U.S. They both contributed their efforts to enabling the embattled church to survive in those dark days. My father, who was a prisoner of war in Germany, carried within himself the cultural traditions and experiences of his father and passed them down to me by example. My, uh, the first years of my life were spent in a displaced persons camp in Hamburg, Germany, part of the United Nations Relief and Resettlement Program after the war. And at, at a later point in my life, after my family had uh, emigrated to the US, um, as a professor of Russian studies, I found myself in the role of cultural translator. I saw how difficult it was for these, the very hardworking uh, Russian, Ukrainian, Bulgarian, 
uh, Polish people who were a part of our community, I saw how difficult it was for them to assimilate themselves. Many of them did not know English. I, my parents did not know English, although they knew several other languages. And so I learned English, uh, of course, uh, but I found myself moving back and forth between two cultures. And, and so this, and uh, as a uh, teacher of the Russian language, which of course is the bearer of culture, I found myself again in this role as cultural translator. And so that sense of understanding what the West didn't know about Rachmaninoff and what I could contribute to it uh, was really born of my personal background, my preparation, uh, and my music, my music experience. My maternal grandmother was a music teacher and concert accompanist in Kiev, and she very likely saw Rachmaninoff perform in that city during one of his tours of southern Russia. And so it was very, it was first the music that drew me, but then it became all of Rachmaninoff that interested me. After one of, uh, one of my recitals of his music, I contacted his uh, grandson, uh, Alexander uh, Barisevich Rachmaninoff, in Switzerland. And to my surprise, he called me just a couple of weeks later, and he invited me to the uh, Rachmaninoff Villa on Lake Lucerne in Switzerland. And so I petitioned my dean, begged him for money to go on this extraordinary journey and so important for my research and so on. So I, I flew there and began my research. And so I met the, grand, the grandson. I've also met uh, Rachmaninoff's great granddaughter and uh, some of my conversations with her informed the project. I visited uh, Rachmaninoff's grandson, who was really the closest living relative to, to the composer himself. I visited him several times uh, at the villa in Switzerland, and I also saw him at Rachmaninoff Society conferences in the UK. And I found that he had a difficult personality. Uh, we spoke only in Russian. Uh, he, he was a complex individual, very generous and very gentlemanly, but not always not easy to be with. I gained his confidence, I think, because I had the necessary historical and cultural qualifications. My family was part of the Russian immigration. My first language was Russian. Uh, I knew the Russian Orthodox Church, and I played his grandfather's music. And so I, I found that broader than Rachmaninoff himself, what I was undertaking was to record an entire way of life of, uh, uh, of the Russian emigration, of the musicians who started out in Russia and then ended up in Europe and the, and the US. And that way of life included a love of art, music, theater, and literature that largely adhered to the ideals of beauty elevated in Plato's writings, the harmony of form, of proportions, of shape and symmetry, and combined with the Orthodox Christian characteristics evolving out of Byzantium, uh, today's, uh, with its capital in Constantinople, which of course is today's Istanbul, the attitude towards beauty embodied in Rachmaninoff's music was very lofty and, and spiritualized. So many features of my life positioned me uh, to write this biography. The facets of his life that I uh, concluded were unexplored were his Russian Orthodox identity, his humanitarian work during World War II, and his muses, women uh, who were important to him, uh, to his art, and also uh, for him personally. Rachmaninoff's Russian Orthodox identity is unexplored or it's badly misunderstood in the existing biographies, especially those in the US and the UK. And I have a couple of uh, examples 
uh, in my PowerPoint. In the, uh, in the very, very good, though it's dated now, the very good biography by J. Lida and Sergei Bertensen, Rachmaninoff's religious views were described, but more from, from the outside, not from, from their interior, and not thoroughly enough. But I found that in the UK, biographers and musicologists of Rachmaninoff lacked an adequate knowledge of Russian orthodoxy or Orthodox Christianity in general, and they grossly misrepresented his personal beliefs and made assumptions about the faith system that were superficial and bewildering even. And so I have in mind the biographies by Max Harrison, uh, Barry Martin, and uh, Jeffrey Norris. They're all excellent works of analysis. Uh, they have many fine qualities, the musicological work, uh, has been considered, you know, very, very good by the Russian team I worked with in uh, Moscow. But they lacked knowledge about his religious and national identity. And so I felt that a biographer of Rachmaninoff ought to know something about the faith tradition that, um, in which he was steeped uh, throughout his life and in which he chose to remain. And moreover, because he wrote uh, sacred works, uh, works that would require a very extensive knowledge from medieval times of this faith tradition, uh, particularly uh, his magnum opus, The All Night Vigil of 1915. And this, is, this has been mistranslated as Vespers. It's not Vespers, which is a different service altogether. So if I uh, take a look at the slide. This is from Max Harrison. And let me move this around. In his, uh, in his biography of Rachmaninoff, uh, he attempts to figure out why, why Rachmaninoff wrote sacred music. And this is a quote from uh, Harrison. One's impression of Rachmaninoff is that he was an easygoing agnostic. And so this already raises a red flag. You know, this was totally false. Then, yet this view is hard to sustain in the face of his two great religious works, the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, 1910, and the All Night Vigil of a few years later. And for, for the, the term liturgy in Orthodox Christianity is the same as mass in Catholicism. They play the same role. They're the basic service that is celebrated every Sunday and on other um, important days. So after all, musicologist Milos Belimirovich refers to them as the highest artistic achievements in the realm of Russian church music. And so back to Harrison, Rachmaninoff's producing of so fervent a score, and these are my, uh, this is my emphasis, as the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom is still a matter for some surprise. And so if you don't laugh at this, you know, you're, you're very troubled by it. And I added, you know, it's surprising that Harrison felt so surprised. Uh, the, the quote is very problematic. Uh, and if you see this slide, aside from the myriad forms of evidence of Rachmaninoff's religious piety, his going to confession, attending services when his schedule allowed, being the godfather to his close friend's children. And here I have in mind uh, his very dear friend and co-collaborator, uh, Fyodor Shalyapin, the uh, one of, one of the most important uh, bases uh, in opera uh, in the 20th century. Rachmaninoff gave major financial support to the Russian Orthodox Church abroad and the St. Sergius Orthodox Theological Institute in Paris gave financial help to Orthodox priests and bishops, requested, requested prayer services for his daughters when they were ill or traveling, venerated icons in his home, and even, even aside from all of this, we don't have to consider what, say, I say or what someone else says. We have Rachmaninoff's own statements about his faith. He tells us 
and they can't be construed in any other way. This is just one of them. I owe to God the gifts given me, to God alone. Without him, I am nothing. And so Rahman, uh, Max Harrison considers Rachmaninoff an easygoing agnostic, similar to the uh, Russian writer Ivan Turgenev, who lived most of his life in Europe. And he may have been an agnostic, but the comparison between Rachmaninoff and Turgenev in their faith orientations really doesn't work. And moreover, nothing about Rachmaninoff was easygoing at any time in his life. So I kind of, de I had to unpack the problematic assessment of Rachmaninoff's uh, religious orientation in this biography by Max Harrison. And it's not the only one. The second one uh, has to do with uh, the biography by Barry Martin. Uh, and this is a wonderful, wonderful book with the great, uh, uh, with a large amount of detail assembled and very good analyses and uh, sort of a real, a real affection for Rachmaninoff's music that, that comes out. Uh, but the problem occurs with his assessment of one of Rachmaninoff's sacred works, Pantelemon, the Healer. And so this was composed in 1899 and Barry Martin describes Pantelemon as a rustic deity who practices herbal medicine, he shakes his knobbly stick at the poisonous herbs and collects the wholesome ones, which it sounds silly. It sounds like a folk tale somehow. And here you have an icon of Pantelemon uh, shown as the herbalist, but there's more to, to reading an icon, uh, which I won't go into here. But so here is the icon of Pantelemon shown as the herbalist. But Martin misses the theological points. Saint Pantelemon was a late third and early fourth century physician who healed the sick without charge in the name of Christ. He was a martyr during the persecution of Christians in Rome in 305 common era and is formally known as Great Martyr Saint Pantelimon. He's an extremely important uh, saint for all of Orthodox Christianity. And so the Orthodox faithful would ask for the saint's intercession at times of illness. The Rachmaninoff family kept an icon of Saint Pantelimon with them, and it hung in his bedroom as he lay dying of cancer in 1943. So we, we know, we know, that he was more than an herbalist shaking his knobbly stick as he searched for, you know, for uh, plants. There was, there was an orthodox context to, uh, to the sacred work by Rachmaninoff that was completely missed by the biographer. And so another icon of uh, Pantelimon, which has, if you see the cross that he's holding, in the symbolism of icons, this is the symbolism of a martyr. And so anyone raised in orthodoxy looking at this or who studies uh, iconography can look at this and see the saint holding the cross like that and know that this is the icon of a martyr. And so it, it was, it was the lack of knowledge of Orthodox Christianity uh, as a part of Rachmaninoff's personal identity and also composing, uh, let's say, predilections. Uh, he very much uh, uh, participated in the, the great school of uh, Russian sacred choral music in uh, Moscow in the early teens of the 20th century. And that was shut down uh, very quickly after the Bolsheviks assumed power. But he wrote sacred choral works and he participated in the life of uh, uh, 
an Orthodox Christian in all of, all of the ways that one would expect. He also put his money behind the formation of the church um, as it struggled to reassemble itself abroad. Something, the, uh, the next area in which I felt I needed to make a contribution was Rachmaninoff's humanitarian work for the Soviet Red Army. Uh, and earlier, uh, after the revolution uh, in the 1920s, he had a, a consciousness of helping others. He had a difficult childhood, uh, many, many challenges in growing up and uh, changing circumstances. And the, the curator of the Rachmaninoff uh, Research Center at Tambo and in um, Ivanovka uh, calculated that Rachmaninoff donated the equivalent of a quarter of his lifetime earnings to others. And so he was very modest about it, never talked about it. But if we can think, think about that in terms of anyone we know or even of our own wishes, that's, that's a lot of money. And by today's standards, Rachmaninoff, who was very highly successful and worked extremely hard, uh, he, he would have been a multimillionaire, but he had, he had plenty of money. He worked to earn the money. Uh, his publications were, um, you know, were produced and sold successfully, but he also remembered those who were in need and suffering. And so uh, he, in the 19, early 1920s, when the newly emerging Soviet Russia was in, in shambles, if we consider even World War I, 1914 to 1918, the revolution of 1917, the ensuing civil war, 1918 to 1922, the country was exhausted. There, the structures and institutions of the new government had not yet formed well enough. And, and so the social contract between the government and the people was not there. People were, they were starving, everything was in chaos. And so I thought that I would read just a few of the letters that were written to Rachmaninoff in the early 1920s. If you, if you ever go to the Rachmaninoff archives in the Library of Congress, uh, there are many, many letters and the, the people, uh, you know, it seems as if the letters are just oozing tears and suffering and, uh, gratitude for his help uh, because they really didn't have it coming from anywhere else. And so let me just read a couple of uh, a couple of these, two or three of these. In one in one letter, some letters were forwarded to Rahmaninoff by someone he knew and the letter, I quote uh, from the letter, one can imagine to oneself the unbelievably difficult living conditions of our Russian musicians and pedagogues. All of them are in need of food, clothing, printed music, and music staff paper. Then another letter that he received from his colleague, uh, his boyhood friend and colleague, Mikhail Slonov from Moscow. And Slonov was a cellist. Uh, I believe he was a cellist. We are all struggling to keep from dying of hunger, cold, and infectious diseases. And many people, the majority of them prominent and familiar to you as well, have died. All people right now are in an extremely difficult situation and wait for death as a savior from their undeserved suffering. And so he, Rahmaninoff was constantly in touch with any organizations he, he could find who would transmit uh, money or supplies to Russia. Uh, he, uh, when the Soviet embassy was established in Washington, he always, and, and in New York, uh, he always referred to it as the Russian embassy and they just accepted this. But, uh, Parcels of food prod products were sent to Moscow State University, to the conservatory, to the Bolshoi Theater, to cultural and scientific organizations of Moscow, Petrograd, Kiev, Kazan, many, many cities. 
uh, the uh, theater uh, director um, and innovator, Konstantin Stanislavski wrote to Rachmaninoff, you're doing a really good deed since the actors are in truth starving, but they keep working. And so the, the conditions were just dire. Uh, at one point, the postmaster in Moscow, uh, when someone came to pick up a parcel, uh, made the comment, who is this Rachmaninoff? He's feeding half of Moscow. And so the humanitarian work was extremely important and pervasive. During, during the war, uh, the Second World War, and I'll bring up this tank, the T-34 tank, he single-handedly financed a tank. Is, uh, Matt, can you see that slide? And so his money yep, provided... Yep. His money provided food, clothing, paper, medicine, and x-ray machines for the Red Army, support for the Russian Orthodox Church in Europe that was um, also experiencing great difficulties. And I'm going to stop the share just to come back to the screen. And so the amazing thing about Rachmaninoff was these things were really not known about him until after his death, they, the concept of Rachmaninoff as providing humanitarian aid was just not, not there. And it was seen and assembled through, through the letters and documents and accounts of people and organizations that received his help. And so because of his, uh, his uh, position, his prestige, he had uh, I, I want to use the word agents, but he had representatives uh, in Europe and he was in, in touch with the International Red Cross working in Europe and Russia. And so he never forgot people who were, uh, who were suffering. And I, I think that this goes along with a certain cluster of moral values. There's uh, the idea of beauty and sincerity uh, of um, a, an integrity uh, in living one's life, but also helping, helping others uh, to lift themselves up. So I wanted to explore the uh, humanitarian activities that Rachmaninoff was involved in. There are many more, and it's really quite a stunning picture. The, uh, the last uh, segment that I want to uh, speak to you about today is the women who uh, were important to him artistically and personally, his muses. And there were, there were many. Uh, Rachmaninoff dedicated in his 45 opus numbers, he dedicated just about everything to someone. Uh, he dedicated one work to the Philadelphia Orchestra. But there was always something that he had in mind uh, uh, as a dedicatee. And he made the statement about his art, that what inspires him, uh, and that it could, it, it could be something, something uh, in nature, could be some, some welling up of uh, memory uh, from his home country and culture. Uh, and he made the comment that a beautiful woman is always a source of inspiration. And so he collaborated with important women performers, uh, but he was also involved with several women. And there are mysteries about, uh, about some of these uh, connections that he had. In fact, the biography by uh, Jay Lida and uh, Bertensohn a uh, very, very good biography of the 1950s that's been republished. Uh, um, I think it was originally published by New York University Press and then was republished by Indiana. Uh, but that uh, biography was rejected by several publishers, including, I think, Oxford, because it did not sufficiently elaborate the period of the turn of the century leading up to Rachmaninoff's marriage. And so it was rejected because the marriage was not explored fully enough. And so 
in one of my meetings with Rachmaninoff's grandson, he began to talk a little bit about his grandmother, whom he knew, um, and her life with her husband. At the same time, uh, this was about 2003, 2004, uh, there was a publication that came out of the uh, research center of Ivanovka, the, the estate of the Rachmaninoffs, and the this um, publication recorded memories from uh, women who had worked on the estate. They were in their 90s. And it really turned out that for a while I was traveling and I was interviewing people in their 90s. Uh, uh, men and men and women. Uh, I interviewed Henry Steinway, uh, who at Steinway Hall in New York, who um, had known Rachmaninoff and the Rachmaninoff family when Steinway himself was in his twenties. So he had an adult memory. But these 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 ninety some year old uh, Russian women who had worked on the Rachmaninoff estate did not hold back, and they. They described all sorts of things that they remembered, such as, such as well, I, one, one of the women uh, recounted, well, I, I read in a biography that Rachmaninoff's wife's family was so good to him. I didn't think they were good to him. And so she would then elaborate some memories and examples. And so, so I, I was uh, meeting with his grandson about his marriage, his grandfather's marriage. Then these recollections of the peasant women uh, came out and were published and they were quite extensive. And you know, when you, when you are interviewing people, you have to consider what, what stake they have. What do they have to lose? What, is, what risks are they taking? What might be their motivation? And in the case of these um, older women, they really didn't have anything to lose and they seemed to want to set the record straight because what they remembered did not match up with what they were reading. And their memories, their collective memories were very consistent. Uh, and they, you know, they were, they were not uh, writing together. They were individual um, letters and pieces of correspondence with the curator of the um, Rachmaninoff Estate and um, a Museum and Research Center. So all of these things were coming out. And there, there was a, uh, an idea that is, it's, it's everywhere. If you, if you look at uh, short histories, uh, biographies of Rachmaninoff during the period of 1899 to maybe 19. 1902, 1903, he was married in April of 1902. The idea of depression, that he was depressed when he composed the uh, Pietro number no. two in C minor. And as I began to look at, put all of these uh, impressions and pieces of information together, it emerged he couldn't possibly have been that depressed because he was very productive and very active. But he did have uh, women on his mind. And uh, so there are three, three women that I want to uh, focus on. Uh, and I'll, I'll wrap up in about 10 more minutes just to give you a sense of um, the time. Uh, one of them, Anna Ladizhinskaya, there is a photo of her, if I can get to it. Uh, this is the only uh, uh, surviving photograph of a woman of gypsy origins. Uh, this is from the 1890s. And so it was the period when Rachmaninoff was beginning to think about a permanent relationship. Uh, she was from a gypsy family. Uh, she was married several years older than Rachmaninoff. Uh, very, very kind and meek. Um, her husband was somewhat of a carouser. Uh, he, him, the husband was musical, but would go out drinking and would be away. And so Rachmaninoff would come to her house in Moscow, uh, would go just about every night and stay there until midnight. And so she was very important to him. Uh, he was passionately in love with her. 
and he dedicated a large scale work to her, uh, his symphony number no. one in D minor and a song, uh, and Rah Rachmaninoff's art songs are, uh, consist of his music set to poetry, uh, primarily of 19th century Russian poets. And so the song, oh no, I beg you don't forsake me. Even that first line just you know, says so much. And so he would spend time talking with her. Her sister was a well-known gypsy singer. And so Rachmaninoff would uh, engage in impromptu recitals at their house. And so these would be musical evenings, evenings of um, intense conversation, perhaps of some unhappiness on Anna's part and frustration on the part of Rachmaninoff, who could not marry her and really didn't have any rights to her. So this was a very important relationship to him. And he was probably still working his way through it uh, when uh, he began to consider other, other possibilities. He could not marry her. And so he was married uh, in 1902 to the second woman uh, who was not his muse. This was his wife, uh, Natalia Satina. Uh, she was also his first cousin. And so her lineage in the aristocracy was very distinguished. Her family went back to the uh, sort of prototypical founders of the uh, medieval Russian uh, state, uh, medieval Rus. Uh, she went back to the uh, Rurikovic, the Rurik dynasty. So her family was very distinguished. But she was a first cousin uh, of Rachmaninoff, and uh, to marry a first cousin was both prohibited by Russian law, and it was also prohibited by the Russian Orthodox Church. However, their status and connections with the monarchy um, enabled them to get special permission. And so they were married in a very small church ceremony and the marriage lasted. Uh, they, they stayed married until his death in 1943. Uh, he never dedicated anything to her and I, you know, I've thought about this so much and I reflect on it uh, extensively in the biography. Uh, she was in love with him. He was the love of her life and the project of her life. He loved her, but it was probably not the great passionate love. You know, love comes in so many different forms. Uh, but it was important to him what she represented. She represented the stability that he really didn't have a connection with his entire, his entire life. They had two daughters together and um, she herself, um, I felt that she, information about her and her um, identity really was underdeveloped in the existing biographies. And she was quite distinguished as a musician in her own right. Uh, she graduated from the Moscow Conservatory with a silver medal. She had uh, very, very good qualities. She was uh, not demonstrative. Uh, she was thoughtful. She was well-educated. And she understood her husband well and what he needed. And her position was not always very enviable because he worked with, you know, many beautiful women uh, performing and uh, so she had, she had quite a lot to, man to manage, but she was an important woman to him and, and he valued her and they had a marriage that worked. It was very successful and it was, um, it was happy in many ways. The third woman is a mystery woman. And this is, uh, this is a discovery that I made, a discovery of the trail, but we haven't yet found the endpoint of that trail. And the, uh, one, in one of my meetings with Rachmaninoff's grandson, he mentioned that his grandmother had told him that Rachmaninoff had a woman in his life who was a constant, a beloved. You know, we might think about Beethoven's immortal beloved, uh, whose identity I think has been disclosed. But uh, 
I was in the uh, Russian National um, Museum of Music. It was previously known as the Glinka Museum. And I was studying the master score of Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto. And this is one associated with the years leading up to his marriage and his marriage, 1902. And on the, uh, the uh, author page, there was a second dedicatee line that was crossed out. And so I pointed to it and I said, what's that? And there were several uh, of my Russian colleagues with me. We were standing around the table and it was almost comical. And so we all pulled out our magnifying glasses you know, just, just as in a, in a comic, and we looked at it, and it was really telling that we all had a magnifying glass. We were all archive rats, so to speak. So one, one of the uh, colleagues said, well, why didn't anybody call this to my attention? I answered, you're here all the time. I'm just here for, you know, a few weeks, uh, but a, a fresh pair of eyes has called attention to this. They even took it to the Russian police to try and figure out what was behind what was crossed out. And apparently, from what the grandson told me, this was a second dedicatee who may have been the daughter of a musician and a therapist who was treating Rachmaninoff for some depression. But my theory is that Maybe it wasn't so much depression, but he was meeting with this woman who was a relative of the uh, therapists. And so there was a mystery woman. And we haven't been able to, we've established some information about her, uh, her family, but we haven't able to actually track her down. But the initials, her initials, are found in another work of Rachmaninoff's without an opus number. And so there are pieces of this mystery that uh, my biography attempts to put together, but it doesn't really solve it. It lays out the whole situation, but it's taken very seriously because if, uh, if what the grandson who got this um, account from his grandmother, from Rachmaninoff's wife, if this account is true, then it can change how we view some of his music uh, um, because we know from tells us that his music is the expression of his feelings, his hopes, his fears, his love for his country and so on. And so in difficult times, the music would be intense and perhaps emotional and conflicted with the cross rhythms. Uh, and in times of happiness, in uh, 1934, when he was settled in the villa in Switzerland, things were going very well. And the grandson told me that uh, his beloved had a house across the lake. And so he could see her but his wife asked him not to bring her to their villa. And so it sounds, you know, it sounds like a difficult, a difficult story, but actually if you think about that generation of musicians even, or artists or even, uh, or writers, you find that complicated situations like this were not so rare. Uh, Fyodor Shalyapin, Rachmaninoff's close friend, was married and I believe had six children with his wife, ballerina, ballerina Yola Tornagi. And then before, before he was separated from her, he set up another relationship and had four more children with a different woman. And the writer Ivan Bunyan also had two relationships at the same time. So we can find in that same generation of creative thinkers, very complicated um, um, emotional uh, situations that they were trying to manage and that maybe uh, also uh, fed their creative springs in different ways. So 
I stumbled really into this mystery woman. And I think it, I think there was, I think there was someone and I, I really leave it for some future um, researchers, um, investigators into Rahman enough to take this further. But my, my biography assembles everything that I could find that is known about woman. Uh, her name was posited based on songs in which her initials appeared uh, as Yelena Dal, and I, in my, let's see, if I can just take that. This is just a representation, but Rahmaninoff in his lifetime seemed to gravitate towards women with the kind of gypsy-ish quality. And I think uh, in Slavic cultures, the gypsy uh, way of life represented freedom and independence and an escape from the uh, the problems of their their usual lives and so i found this image and you know i'm not trying to steer anyone's thinking in terms of what she may have looked like but uh, there there was very likely a mystery woman and rachmaninoff worked extremely hard i'm going to stop the share he worked very hard to keep her uh, as a private figure, he kind of built this wall around his uh, his family and his identity, uh, both because he was a, a an international personality and because of his his own need uh, for um, for extended periods of quiet time for his work and to protect his family. So. So in my biography, I tried to find what was lacking in previous studies. And as I went along, I, I just seemed to stumble into these, um, these new directions that I felt were important. And so I've tried to give you a sense of what the project meant to me personally, how my family's life in um, emigration seemed to parallel the life of Rachmaninoff and how the project grew and really consumed a good, a good part of my life. But it's finished. It, was, it appeared in October, so it's about three months out. And... Um, I think contains contains a lot of information that has not appeared before. So, well, I think I should probably stop because I can I can go on. But I'm very grateful to all of you for uh, listening and for staying as long as you have. So, Matt, maybe you can take it from here. Yeah, no, Valeria, thank you so much. And uh, before we go into the q and I just wanted to say, I think really the, the perfect storm of qualities that you both partially were born into and partially uh, developed as skills as a musician, as a researcher, really, really uh, helped, led you to resonate to the, the beat of the soul of Rachmaninoff in ways that I don't think anyone else that I've ever met has. So to be able to pierce through a lot of the misinformation, the fallacies, the the, this, the analyses that have been put forth as authority out of context or with all sorts of fallacious compositions. I, I think you're setting the record straight and doing great justice to uh, Sergei. So thank you. And uh, I know we, we have a few people who have been waiting in the in queue. Um, Dr. Ed Lazansky um, has been waiting to share something. He's been actually a part of a project that he's going to say something about regarding Rachmaninoff and a certain film uh, that was almost made and maybe still will be made. So, uh, Ed, are you still there? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I'm here. And uh, <clears throat> Valeria, thank you so much. Uh, I enjoyed, uh, of course, your presentation. And um, what we now, uh, you, you mentioned that you, you know, uh, as, as an emigre from, from uh, you know, Russian uh, state, I mean, your family, right? You were born in the West. Um, and um, we, all of us who, uh, have the same fate now in the same 
position is Rahmanian because there's a war going on. It's a war, and it's a war when Russia is fighting against the what we call collective West. It means 50 countries, at least this is at least 50 countries are fighting against Russia. So this is uh, something that um, you know, uh, and uh, Russian immigration is divided, probably the same way. Rachmaninov, of course, wanted to help um, his home country. There were some who resisted that, mm -hmm. and right now the same split here. But um, I just want to mention a couple of things. Um, uh, I was approached 10 years ago by um, a State Department, actually, from all, all places. State Department retired official, his name is Walter Reed, who um, uh, wanted to make a film about Rachmaninov about exactly this time when he was, uh, you know, trying to help his, uh, uh, at that time, USSR. And he was not only raising money, as you, you mentioned, uh, but also uh, he was planned to ret even return. Uh, and he was communicating with uh, Soviet embassy uh, and applied for visa. And mm -hmm. he got a personal message from no one else by Joseph Stalin, who sent mm -hmm. him a very warm message, despite uh, Rachmaninov was very critical of Soviet Union and uh, communists and Bolsheviks and all that. So, you no, know, in times like this, uh, things change. So um, this film, unfortunately, didn't materialize, although the script was there. And uh, Walter, I helped him to meet uh, you know, pretty high level officials in, in uh, Moscow, it was, I'm talking about 2012, it, mostly in, in political circles, in cultural circles, even minister of culture and all that. But no, the funds, you know, this, <laughs> to make a film, you need uh, money and uh, uh, script exists. Um, I, and I don't know, Walter Reed, uh, frankly, he was pretty old at the time. I don't know what's going on. Maybe after this uh, a presentation. I'm inspired now maybe to revive <laughs> this project. We'll try to find waters, see uh, if we can, because Narakmaninov deserves a f film. Uh, probably there are some films, maybe you know, there are some uh, films made about, but this film was particularly about his change of tune and from, from uh, uh, no, uh, acceptance of Bolshevik revolution and, and, and communism. Mm -hmm into supporting his country in time of uh, horror. And now I think what we see here, it's a horror. I don't know if you can say it's equivalent to World War II, but at that time, uh, many European countries were fighting with Hitler, but now the whole West, and most importantly, the United States was on the side of the Soviet Union. So we are going through a very difficult time. And uh, yeah. thank you for your presentation and well, can I can I respond? Uh, yeah. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for that comment. That's very important. Uh, Rachmaninoff forgave. He forgave everyone. He forgave the country that uh, the government that essentially destroyed his entire way of life. He uh, he did. He always dreamed about going back. And in January of 1943, and of course this was um, in the middle of the Battle of Stalingrad, you know, which was from August of 42 and ended in, in February of 43 as the official conclusion. Uh, Rahmaninoff lived long enough to see that, but he was in touch with, as you pointed out, with the uh, Soviet embassy. And um, he actually went for an interview because he, decided that he and presumably his wife as well um, were going to return. And this was under Stalin. And Stalin had promised Rachmaninoff an apartment in Moscow, his own, his own car, and some funds. Uh, we, don't, we don't really know Stalin's motives. Maybe he felt it would be prestigious to have Rachmaninoff come back, that he could use this as some sort of you know, publicity and uh, that part isn't clear, but it is clear that Rachmaninoff considered the proposal seriously and that he went to the Soviet embassy and met with the young Andrei Gromyko, who, and who was the ambassador to the United States at that time. He was really beginning his career. And so Gromyko met 
Rachmaninoff, it was the only time he met him. And in Gromyko's own memoirs, he describes this. And so uh, Rachmaninoff was ill. Uh, it's not clear whether his wife knew about it, but uh, he developed a very rapidly progressing cancer. And so he was dead by March 20, his death is March 28th. And so in January, he wanted to return and wanted to return as quickly as possible. And so it's a very dramatic series of events, but we have the documents, we have accounts. He was ready to go back. Uh, maybe, you know, he knew he was going to die. He wanted to die in Russia. And um, concerning the film, there, Alexander Rachmaninoff uh, also was hoping to make a film and he had committed some funds to it, uh, which he would title The Diabolical Triangle. And this was concerning Rachmaninoff, his wife, and this mystery woman. But the film, and he had co contacted some people in Hollywood, but the project fell through. But there are a few quote, quote unquote documentaries made, uh, but they're very dated and they, you know, they're, they're not brought up to date and they're, they don't have this information that I think is important. And so if there's any, uh, any attempt to make something in film, I think, I think a documentary where segments could be made and put together, uh, you know, would be, would be very effective. And especially since this year, you know, was the year of Rachmaninoff and to start something and when so many celebrations will be taking place, certainly in Russia, uh, you know, could be very promising. But what's, what's amazing about his identity is that he was, a, he was so multifaceted and he moved around so much. There's even question, why was this, this peripatetic way back and forth between the U.S. and Europe constantly constantly traveling. And we can imagine his wife having to organize all of this, you know, constantly renting, you know, renting uh, uh, villas in Europe for summer stay and composing and then back to the US and, uh, you know, absolutely dizzying almost. And so uh, he was so active in so many ways. I mean, this was someone who was fully fully alive and fully engaged to both produce a good good standard of living for his family but also to be to lend his prestige to other organizations so it's a very it's a very big big personality and much more than the image that is usually associated with him if anybody is listening on youtube uh, right now, if you have an idea or want to produce a documentary or film and or film, uh, make sure that Ed Lozanski and Valeria Nolan are high on your list of people to consult. Um, so just putting that out there. Um, Adam, the stage is yours. But Adam, you are on mute. I am here. All right. Well, thank you for that presentation. I learned a lot about Rachmaninoff's personal life. Um, my question is more about his music, and I don't know if you can touch on this. When when we read about him, we kind of get the impression that after the World War I years, he was kind of a dinosaur, um, s stuck in old ways when there were new musical ideas that were at the forefront. And I think there's a famous story he had just heard the radio broadcast of uh, Shostakovich's mm -hmm. Seventh Symphony. And after it was over, his response was, well, let's have tea. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered if that impression is true um, or, or if there's some other insight you can offer us on that. That's, that's a wonderful question. The insight is true. Uh, it also has to do with his Russian Orthodox identity because the evolution of musical forms as well as the evolution of the icon, and all of this I bring out in my, in my book, is not so much in striking out in different directions, but in perfecting, clarifying, revisiting the tradition that is already there and building on it. What Rachmaninoff did was he evolved his own style and he continued to evolve it. Uh, his, for example, his uh, 
Piano Concerto Number no. Four, which he there, there is a revision, and then there is the original version. And he worked on it actually during the years of the of World War One and the Revolution. You know, terrible circumstances. And then in 1926, he revised it um, and went back to the original. And the original is the one usually performed today, and it's considered the superior one. But if you listen to the first few lines of that fourth piano concerto, it's very bright. It's very, it's about as modernist as Rachmaninoff would get. And um, there's a thinning of the texture. The chords are very different. Also in the teens, he wrote, um, and this was a genre he himself invented, the etude tableau. There are two sets of them. And the uh, Russian pianist Svetoslav Richter uh, made the statement that they were cutting edge for their day. Uh, but Rachmaninoff made many statements about modernist music. Uh, you know, someone like Charles Ives, for example, you know, he, did, he didn't understand it. He, it didn't speak to him. It didn't have any soul and so on. Uh, so he, 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 maybe Debussy was about as, as modernist as he could get. But he... That, that was, a, the 1920s were difficult for him in that way because he, he described himself as a ghost wandering in a world grown alien, that here, new culture, new language, and the English was his fourth language. So just imagine yourselves, fourth language, uh, the U.S. not like Europe and Russia, which were more like each other. And so trying to make his way and then also being crucified as a relic of the past. But what he did, what he did conclude, um, and based on his experiences, was that the audiences always loved him and the critics would always be, dis not always because he had his uh, proponents, uh, but the critics would be uh, disparaging. And he had the note that, well, you know, I wrote my, um, second piano concerto and they the critics would say well you know the first was good the second is maybe not so good then i wrote the third one and they would say well you know the third is not so good the second was really good and he would say you see how it goes so he was and he was even asked the question uh in one interview as to whether it was possible for a composer to be popular with audiences and also be popular with critics at the same time and he had to think about it and concluded, well, yes, I think it's possible. So he, you know, he, he, he was connected to a tradition in the past that was not currently in vogue uh, in the U.S. and in Europe, but he loved American jazz. And this is very interesting. I'm actually, my next, my current book is on... Uh, uh, a, on American jazz, on Donald Brown, who is uh, one of the important jazz um, composers of this age. And uh, the Russian emigres, this would be Vladimir Horowitz, uh, Rachmaninoff, uh, Salati, they attended jazz clubs wherever they were. And Rachmaninoff made the statement that the future of American music is in its jazz. And we don't have any recordings surviving, but apparently from, from uh, contemporaries who were there, uh, Rachmaninoff loved to improvise jazz in his free time at home. And so uh, he was very complimentary of uh, the Paul Whiteman Orchestra. Uh, he, you know, as I said, attended clubs whenever he could, the blind pianist Art Tatum was someone who just blew away these pianists. I think it was uh, Vladimir Horowitz who heard Tatum and he said, I'm just not going to play anymore after hearing him. So the connection, you know, it, and jazz has only recently been accepted by the classical music community. And so Rachmaninoff maybe didn't warm to uh, modernist music, but he did warm very much to American jazz. 
And um, he was fascinated by, you know, the, the jazz scales, the pentatonic scales and, um, you know, the harmonic combinations. So there's a little bit more to, you know, to that, you know, to his sort of um, becoming embedded in American musical life in the 20s and 30s. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah there, there's a lot of different contemporaries from other fields as well who have a similar sort of experience. I, I was brought to a memory of, of Einstein, you know, uh, being treated with Max Planck in a similar fashion as the outdated, obsolete scientists who don't know how to to think in the, the new scientific ways that the young, uh, the young new generation of statisticians and, and probability theorists were, were um, adopting. And Norman Rockwell, a painter as well, who was a contemporary in many ways, also had, had a similar feeling and would write in the 50s uh, about not really um, being able to make this shift. And he wouldn't want to because he just saw, saw that there was something a little bit unnatural in the aesthetic community. So it's interesting to, to also sort of see a parallel in the modernists in music mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. Rachmaninoff seemed to detect there was something just off. Although, as you pointed out, the, the jazz... Uh, component is is an interesting new dimension to appreciate in that whole uh, that whole dynamic. It's fun, but you know, but you know, Matt, there's something mm. even larger than that, and mm. you'll recognize it being someone who goes very deeply into history and and uh, bringing to what you uh, ex investigate a real thickness of past experience. That I I think it has to do with the civilization and its relationship to the past. Is there respect from, for the past? Is the past viewed as something worthy of building on and um, having continuity with? Or is the past something that needs to be chopped off? And that was certainly the, the approach of the, uh, the Soviet um, committees after 1917, to cut off the past, to build a new world, and so on. And so all of you might encounter references to what happens to a person without memory, the person who has amnesia, and more, moreover to an entire culture, a musical culture or science, scientific culture. What is the attitude towards the past? Is it one of respect and appreciation or is it one of disdain? We have to destroy it or it doesn't mean anything because we're do what we're doing is superior in some ways. So it really does raise some very big questions. Uh, you know, mm -hmm, can, I can you know, go even beyond, but the science is there too. What is the attitude yeah. towards those who have built what exists at a given point? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Satomi, do you still have a question? Well, kind of more of a comment. Like I just want to, uh, you know, appreciate so much, Valeria, for. I like that coming from that personal perspective because, um, as you say, you know we can listen to the music and then we can associate more of the of the person. And and so I just wanted to say I, I now you know because yeah I grew up in the fifties and sixties and I from pop to jazz was really what I grew up with and uh, so. I now want to lis listen, of course, Matt, with Matt, too, we learned a lot of the appreciation for the classical, but now I really want to get into Rash Mananath. Oh, like he sounds like it would be quite an experience. Uh, do, does he have actual um, recordings or is it of other people that are recording his music? He has actual recordings. And this, wow. is, this is so exciting because uh, mm. he recorded with the Philadelphia Orchestra, which he loved and uh, he considered the, the absolute best in the world. But he recorded, the recordings are with um, Leopold Stokowski and with Eugene Ormandy. And so uh, we have his recordings of the uh, second concerto, the third concerto, uh, the Rhapsody on a theme of Paganini and some shorter pieces. So. Uh, what's, what is something that I didn't mention is that Rachmaninoff uh, play, felt that music should be played as fast as the tempo and the uh, dynamic markings would allow. 
And so they've even clocked Rachmaninoff, you know, who plays the second concerto with, with the orchestra, of course, yeah. who plays it most quickly. And um, he, he did that because his music is so dense that as he called them pearls on a string, the notes of the harmony of the melody need to stay together and need to be heard. And he played as a composer. He wanted to grasp the whole and shape the whole. Uh, I think only the South American artist, I think she's Argentinian, uh, Martha Argerich. She played the, uh, I think it was the third concerto, faster than Rachmaninoff. So uh, why am I saying this? Uh, I, I forget why I, I went down <laughs> went down in this direction, but uh, the, his recordings there were oh, recordings by him, and also we can hear him playing, and it's it's absolutely mind blowing. Pianists, you know, are just they're really struck at how he can keep all of the elements together. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to bring out something else as well. There are very good interpretations of Rachmaninoff as well. Um, yeah. But like you said, some of them are a little superficial, or I don't know if that's that, the right Well, thing. there are. There are. Uh, certainly uh, Horowitz, you know, Horowitz is a good interpreter. Uh, uh, Walter Gieseking, who was a German pianist, very, very good, you know, uh, Svetoslav Richter, and... Uh, a number of pianists today. There's some very good Chinese pianists. Uh, oh, I know. I wanted to mention that I didn't choose to focus on musicological elements in this um, biography, but they are there. And so if you're thinking that it's only, or let's say that it's about his life, but not about his music, there is quite a lot of analysis, both of myself and by myself and by others. There are many extended passages uh, analyzing the music. I'm not a musicologist, but I am a musician, and uh, I had access to very good musicologists. Yeah. And so it's there. that's in the biography as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I was going to just mention like the uh, classics to jazz that are combined now, like Jim Hall has a, a, a piece, a 20-minute piece called Concerto. And it's just really beautiful how he, and uh, there's four other really well-known um, jazz players, how he just combines that uh, uh, classical and, and jazz. And I, and I can see the two can go so well mm -hmm. to, together, you know, mm -hmm. this sort of fusion that we're seeing now. But um, so I'm glad you brought that up that um, I hope to see more of that. And, and I can see Rat Rashmanov, <laughs> his music, uh, just could blend so well because he has that sort of uh, passion there. That well, um, even even in the cross rhythms, you know, there's a syncopation that is very very jazzy. His piano, he has two. He wrote two piano suites, I think in the 1890s, and um, so piano suites number one and number two. But they have some jazz elements to them. Yeah. Uh, and of course, jazz itself has split up into so many different directions. But I think some of the finest contemporary jazz pianists or musicians are the ones who are classically trained. Yes. And they, also they, jazz came out of the gospel, the very Negro mm -hmm. spirituals, too. And so that kind of extreme. And then you're... Satomi, so, so Satomi. So uh, so mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we, we, we have a limited amount of time, though. Oh, okay, so sorry. I, I don't okay. cut that off. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, hey, well, thank uh, you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, Deborah. Yes, uh, just a quick comment, not a question, but I really thank you very much for your presentation. I hope you can hear me. Yes, uh, I can. Okay, great. Yeah, so my background is uh, my grandmother came from Kishinev, and she was born in the year that they had the uh, prog pogroms against the Jews. A terrible pogrom. This was before the Nazis, and uh, that she was born in that year, nineteen apparently nineteen oh three. She didn't have records, but uh, she was in Kishinev, the capital of Moldova, when the Russians 
came there during the Russian Revolution and they stayed apparently at my grandmother's home. She had to stay outside. This is, I wish I could have known more about history when she was actually alive so that I could, you know, get the full flavor of what really happened in this stuff. But I, I think she came to America in 1922 or 23, somewhere around there, and my grandfather as well. And then further down the road, my mother, uh, you know, she introduced me to classical music in, in general. Uh, she used to listen to classical music and she loved Dvorak and the New World Symphony. Mm -hmm. I used to hear that kind of stuff in my house when I was young. And then she married a uh, a man who escaped from a Nazi concentration camp. So he escaped, he was married, he had a child, and then his wife passed away. And his second marriage was to my mother. And then things didn't work out for them after about seven years and he divorced her. But, you know, so that's kind of my background. So I have the Russians, I have the Polish, I have the classical music, you know, somewhere all in there. My grandmother used to speak in Yiddish in the house and, and probably had all those Russians speaking too. I, I'm not really sure. So I, I just was totally fascinated when I heard you were going to be doing this presentation. I really, really wanted to hear about somebody else that I hadn't heard about because all I hear about is Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, you know, and the famous ones, you know, Brahms, and then a little bit of, you know, Dvorak and things like that. But I had never heard of any of this story about Rachmaninoff. I'm going to definitely be listening. And the little clip that you paid was beautiful. I really enjoyed it. And so it's just a quick comment. It's, and I really appreciated your presentation. I'll get your book, read it, you know, at some point. And, and thank you very much for all your hard work over the years. It's been a long, long uh, road and, and a, a very good road. I'm sure you, you look back on it not as 25 years wasted on something that, you know, but something that really contributed, contributes to history, to humanity. And, and it's, it's great. It's wonderful. It's very, very, very inspiring. <laughs> So well, thanks. thank you. That's that's a that's a wonderful comment. I think I think what's coming out of some of these comments is an investigation into one person's life gets all of us thinking about our own lives and the lives of the the cultures we're a part of, rather than thinking of ourselves as somehow separated from those cultures. And so you think back, you think back kind of deeply into your into your past, and it's what you discover and what becomes meaningful that helps helps you to helps to helps you to figure out who you are and that's very rich and then you can decide how you're going to interact with the you know the modern world that you know that is um, ongoing mm -hmm. absolutely I, I had a quick uh, question um, in your in your research what what is it in your mind that you think was at the heart of the a restoration of an acceptance and encouragement of, of classical uh, culture within Russia and, and also religious institutions um, in, you know, al along the way, obviously things got, were so terrifying at, at the early phases of the Bolshevik revolution and in, in, in the twenties. So yeah, we, how would you put that into words? Uh, yeah. Well, the, the classical actually never went away. Mm. Uh, there, I think, you know, Russia, uh, and even through, even into its Soviet, its 70 year Soviet period, you know, was a, it was a traditional culture. And then with the, the kind of the Soviet jargon and the ways, the imposition of, uh, you know, the, uh, the styles and um, all of the artistic experiments of the 1920s and 1930s, some of them are wonderful and, you know, some of them were awful. But I think the classical never really went away. And um, there, were, there were several monasteries that remained active. There's a book that's it's internationally very well known and it exists in English translation. It's called Everyday Saints. It's, um, it's, very, it's, very, it's funny and it's touching and some of it is difficult reading, but it's uh, so engaging. And so the, the church managed to, the Russian Orthodox Church managed to somehow stay, stay alive, you, you know, just in a very small way. And with classical music, uh, the, the um, art song tradition, you know, the romances, I think they never really went away. They, they stayed as a stream in the culture, uh, even if, you know, the, the Soviet culture and um, all of this was kind of codified between 1932 and 34. 
uh, you know, that uh, the hero had to appear this way and the heroine this way. And, uh, you know, they had to be from the proletariat, from the working class or the peasant class. And along with this, you know, writers would still adhere to traditional forms. And so the, you know, those ways kind of stayed as part of Soviet culture. They, they made their way, um, maybe they weren't prominent, uh, but there is one church that is, um, it was pointed out to me, and I don't, I don't, I can't, I can't remember the name of it at the moment, but it was in Moscow. And one of the older scholars, Boris Nikitin, said this church every year, and this was under Stalin as well, performed several movements of Rachmaninoff's all night vigil on his birthday. And they, you know, they didn't get in trouble. And so you had these pockets of preservation of some of the traditional forms that went throughout Soviet, the Soviet period. Wow. Valeria, thank you so much. I'm going to give people a chance, one last chance. If somebody has a question or a thought that they'd like to share, now would be your last chance to throw it out there. Or if not, just simply wait for the recording to come online, watch and share this video. OK, I, I think you've given us a heck of a lot to think about, and you've inspired us to listen to a lot of music. Um, hopefully, you've also Please inspired some people to buy your book. Uh, which we're going to make available in the, in the description box of this video. So people who want to uh, jump on that, they can pick it up online. Um, is there any way that they could get a copy directly from you signed or something? Or is it specifically through Amazon, things like that, that they have to go? No, well, I no, I don't have copies. The uh, okay. You need to order. The, the publisher is, they're printing books as they're ordered. But the okay. books are, you know, they can be ordered through regular bookstores, Barnes & Noble, and so on can be ordered from Amazon and, um, or, you know, or from the publisher. But I mean, if anybody would like me to sign it, I'd be happy to, but you have to get the book <laughs> and send it to me. So, uh, but it's, they did a beautiful job uh, yeah. with the book. And um, I've, I've just been, I never, I really didn't think I would finish it. I thought somehow this is going to be hanging over me <laughs> the rest of my life. But uh, somehow you find the energy to get it done. But I want, to, I want to thank you, Matt, again, and Cynthia, uh, your co-founders of Rising Tide Foundation, for the important work that you do. And um, it's very important in these times. And so all of us, you know, if we're able to, you know, support Rising Tide Foundation. And um, let's keep these symposia going. Amen to that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for taking the Sunday. Next week we have Adam Sedia who's going to do a, a, a deep dive into Goya, the world in which Goya was operating, the uh, yeah. types of transport. Yeah. Actually, Adam, would you like to say a word to uh, to maybe tease your uh, the audience? What Happily, you yes. Okay. The, um, the focus of the presentation is going to be Goya's black paintings, um, which mm -hmm. are probably among his most famous and um, most, I think, misunderstood works. And the, the goal of the presentation is to understand them through the lens of Goya's life and experiences and his times, which were the Napoleonic Wars. So there's a lot of action going on. All right. That'll be exciting. So that's next next Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I thank you once again, Valeria. Your your gift sharing your wisdom is just so appreciated. And thank you, the everyone. The pleasure is mine. For taking the time. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.